Hey, Hello. nice to see you again. Hi. So, you have seen your own genome. Mm. What what did you learn about yourself? Well, of course, I, I learned a lot about you know disease risks, uh, and some of them are quite higher than the average. <laughs> Was it what you expected, or were there some surprises? Mm, there were a few surprises. Mm. Yeah. Um, but for me, that the physical diseases um, weren't the interesting thing. I mean, what I thought was really interesting was what I got to know about genes that influence the brain and thereby influence our, our behavior, our personality, basically. And that wasn't available commercially. I had to, you know, go to the University of Copenhagen, be in a, um, an experiment that they, they do there. Um, and what I found out is that there is like a handful of genes that have different variants. You can have what they call a sensitive variant and a robust variant. Um, and I found out that for all these genes, <laughs> I, I have the sensitive variant, mm -hmm. uh, which is one that, you know, genes that will predispose you for, give you a higher risk of depression, anxiety, um, being, you know, stress sensitive and, and all this stuff. And what has it changed for you personally, this new knowledge? Did it change your sense of identity? It didn't change my personality, but it changed my understanding of where my personality came from. So it gave me a, a biological self-knowledge, um, which is extremely important and which has given me a lot in the way of, you know, knowing myself and accepting some things about myself that I used to have trouble with knowing much more about our biological makeup and having the possibility, all of us, to, to have you know, our information will mean that we will start to think of ourselves as you know, biological beings, as you know, very upgraded animals. Um, and the idea of you know, a soul and, and a psyche that, that's not all biology will fade and we will realize on a societal level that we are, you know, biological systems. And that will mean uh, that we will have, you know, it will be much easier for us, for example, to say, well, if, you know, if I'm a piece of biology, um, an intricate one, um, and, and biology can, is, is malleable, it can be, you know, tampered with, then we will want to, you know, do much more to ourselves. Um, change the way we think because we know that, you know, the brain works this way um, and, and, you know, by this kind of drug or this kind of therapy, I can make it work a different way. I, I don't want to be introvert. I want to be, you know, more extrovert. I want to be this, that or the other. It will become much more natural to tamper with ourselves uh, and our biology. But it doesn't give you a feeling of being determined uh, in a very strict way, that you mm -hmm. are, you know, just the outcome of some biological process. Well, I think with the genetics revolution, we are hopefully getting away from the idea of genetic determinism, mm -hmm. because that is what genetics tell you. You cannot look at a person's genome and say, this person is going to end up a criminal, or this person is going to end up a CEO. It, that's not the way <laughs> it works. And the more you delve into genetics, the more complex it gets, because it is always about the interplay between your genes um, and your physiology and your environment. People will start having little phone apps that will, you know, tell them, so what is this person's uh, genetics and how compatible are they with mine according to the latest science? And, you know, on, on dating sites, people will probably ask, you know, send me your, you look good in pictures, but please send me your genetic profile and I'll, you know, log into whether I want to meet you or not. Um, and, and, I mean, in, in a way, it's just going a little further than, you know. A little further? Yeah, a little further than when you go out and, I mean, you do look for people's genetics. You just, you didn't have access to them before. You had access to what they look like, which is of course genetically determined and, and you know, what they do, are they intelligent and you know, and you, you know the phrase, you know, that, that women can say, oh, this is the guy I want children with. But that's because they look at, you know, what they can glean from the outside. They look for, you know, good genetics in a way. They might call it something else, but, but it is 
you know, it, it is, they want, you know, good stock. Yes, but still it sounds a bit cruel because most of the romantic movies are about feeling part of something that you, you, you have to accept as it, as it will be and not just calculating, I mean. Uh, but people have always calculated. You're, you're saying... I'm a romantic, you were saying. Romantic movies are, they're exactly romantic because it's something people that's unreal. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, people are not it's like not that. how it happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not, people think about, for example, you know, guys think about, you know, how women look. It means an awful lot to them. And for a lot of women, it means an awful lot, you know, what position a man has was what, you know, how much money he makes. That's very unromantic. Yes. And, but on average, it, it's true. And you find somebody out there who is sort of in your class, right? Mm -hmm. um, yes. And but then you discover someone who's looking very hot, but you discover that he has or she has a, uh, um, a high risk of early Alzheimer's, but it's still very hot. Yeah. So how... You then know. you have to weigh the things, of course. Okay. But, but that's it. But one thing I could imagine would happen is that people start perhaps, I mean, they have relationships, but perhaps they will think more in terms of when they have kids and maybe they want to not have kids with each other maybe. Maybe they want a sperm donor or an egg donor because one of them you know, has genetic quirks that they don't want to uh, proceed with. So I, I could imagine that, that you know, we have a great relationship, but, but let's give our kids some better genes than yours, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All this knowledge, uh, if it becomes public, and it will become public, you can easily imagine that it will be used by insurance companies, so it can be used in bad ways. Sure. Uh, all knowledge can be used in good and bad ways. And I'm sure insurance companies could, could use this in a way that we would say, how horrible. I'm sure that, let's say, employers, prospective employers could, you know, use it in ways to, you know, screen out people because of genetics of, and because of a risk that might never, you know, turn out to materialize. But on the other hand, you could say, in the case of the insurance uh, world, this is a challenge to our system, in fact, because if we can pinpoint risk much more accurately than we can today, we should have a discussion in society of how insurance should work. Should you actually pay for your genetic risk? Or should we have a solidaric system where everybody pays the same? Or you could even imagine, you know, you have your uh, genetic makeup and you sit down with the insurance company and they will say, well, because of these risks, you have to maintain your weight below a certain point or you have to not smoke or you have to blah, blah, blah. And if you will give your signature on that, you know, you can lower your premium. Otherwise, you know, pay. So people like me who, who are afraid maybe to know anything, um, they don't have a, a promising future. No, you guys will die out. Mm. I think. Well, we all die out, but, <laughs> yeah, but, but, but it's, uh, so yeah, but why, it's, it will why, not be tolerated. But why don't you want to know about anything? That, that's why I, I simply don't get it. I think it's just fear yeah. or um, the fear of worrying too much about, you know, these 10% more risks of some, I wouldn't be able to handle that very but isn't, uh, rationally. Isn't, but isn't the sum of worries constant? Constantly I, growing. No, it's, it's a constant. You, you can't, you will probably, if, if you have some kind of, you know, you, your worry level mm -hmm. is probably very much tied to your personality yes. for all of us. Yes. So, you know, you probably worry let's say this much. Yeah. And whether you get your genetic information or you just hear about there's something in, in the water or there's something in the yeah. food, you will worry this much. I suppose the best thing that will happen is that I find out I have a tendency to worry. <laughs> you <laughs> probably to stick will my head find in the out. Yeah. Then it's kind of comforting. So maybe you're you right. Maybe therapy. I should change it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>
But, but when you realize that there is no essential self, that sort of change becomes okay. I think you could say that, that religion is a function of our biology. We have a great tendency towards what you might call religion or just superstition because our brain is you know, organized the way it is. Uh, I think that there is a, an anthropologist, um, Pascal Boyer, um, who said it really brilliantly that, that religion is actually a cognitive parasite. It's, it's so ingrained, it's a tendency that, that we can, we won't get rid of religion. But if you, if you think of it as a cognitive parasite, uh, something that grabs hold of our brains, it will just mutate. As we get into you know, a different society, a more technological society as we are today, you will, you know, people live with the results of science around them. They go to the doctor, they don't go to the witch doctor anymore. They don't go to the priest, they go to the doctor because they know that they are biological beings and they need to be treated by a doctor. But they still believe in, in these ideas of a creator or something bigger than us. And, and that will continue, but it will just be different beliefs, I think. If you look at, for example, um, the Nordic countries, Religion is, is more and more becoming, <laughs> I would always say, almost say a, a sort of a wellness phenomenon. You, now you hear all these studies saying that it's good for you to have a faith. You know, your blood pressure will go down, you will live longer, you will be happier if you have a religion. It's actually so healthy. It's healthy, so go out there and, and get a faith. <laughs>